You know, I was talking with someone recently and they were sharing with me just the stress that they feel just riding the subway uh, these days because of the rising crime rate in our city. And uh, as well, the, the stress that is upon them at work because of the depleted workforce uh, that has come about uh, because of the conditions of things as well. And I, uh, I was thinking, this person was telling me how that they really, they, they, they need to get rid of the anxiety in their mind. They're very stressed out. And thinking about that, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask all of you a personal question. Do you need a breakthrough in your life? Do you need any kind of a breakthrough in life? Maybe you need, you need God's healing touch upon your body. Maybe you need uh, his restoration physically. Maybe like this person, you need mental soundness or emotional stability. Maybe you need a breakthrough in a relationship. Maybe you have problems in your family. Maybe you need a uh, breakthrough in your relationship in your church. You have church problems. You have problems with people in the church. Or maybe you need a breakthrough in your relationships at work with coworkers. What about this? Do you need a breakthrough in your spiritual life? What about your spiritual life? Do you need deliverance from some pet sin that you just simply can't seem to ever get victory over? Do you need a breakthrough and God's touch upon the hardness of your heart? Or maybe you're paralyzed with fear. Or you're held in the grip of some unrelenting grief. Or maybe you need a touch upon your, your selfish way of living, your selfish lifestyle. I want to ask you to turn with me to Mark chapter 10 this afternoon. I'm going to share some thoughts and then I am going to have you do as we did last week, some interaction with me. But as you turn to Mark chapter 10, there's going to come a question from the lips of Jesus to a man in need that needed a breakthrough in his life. And basically, he said to the, the, to the man, as we would say, what do you want from me? And I want to I wanna insert that question into your thinking right up front this afternoon. What do you want God to do for you? Seriously now, what is it that you want God to do? Do you want God to do anything for you? Or what is it that you want God to do for you? The account that I want you to turn to begins in verse 46. It's the account of, of this blind man. He's called Bartimaeus. And I think that he is really a great illustration of how any one of us can unleash God's miraculous power in our lives. And I think that this man perhaps stumbled on it. Not sure about that, but... It certainly bears us looking into it. So I want to do that after we pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the scripture and for this passage this afternoon. Barmaeus, thank you for your tenderness, the way you deal with people, the way you care for them, the way that you communicate to them, the way that you touch them, the way that you unleash your miraculous power in people's lives that are looking to you. Lord, a lot of us need your touch today in one way or another. We need your power at work in our lives. And I just pray that we would uh, get instruction and that we would get encouragement. And we'd think this thing through together as we consider these verses just in a brief way, but I trust in a mighty way for your glory. We pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, I will turn you to verse 46, and I want to read just the first three to begin. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho, that's Jesus, with his disciples, a great number of people, blind, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, 
sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. That's a nice way of saying, shut up. But he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now, I want to show you, by way of illustration, in the life of Bartimaeus, how to have a breakthrough with God. How to have God's healing touch on any area in your life. How to unleash God's miraculous power in your life. And the first thing that I would submit to you in these verses that we just read is here is a man that was willing to seek. That's really the first step. To have God smile on your life is really all that you or I or anyone needs. What we ought to covet, what we ought to want more than anything else in life is to have God smile on our life. He promises that if we will seek his smile, if we will seek his presence, if we will seek God, that everything else will work out, that everything else that we have need of will be added. Bartimaeus, he began begging that day, seeking help from anyone that happened to be passing by. But when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was in the neighborhood, when he heard that Jesus was passing by, faith began to rise in his heart because he realized that Jesus was more than just the ordinary man. It says in these verses that he cried out. See that in verse 47? He cried out. Interesting terminology. It actually is the same words that would be used to describe the cry of a crow. If there's any obnoxious crying bird, it's a crow. Right? They're loud. They're noisy. <laughs> when you hear it's a distinctive it's a distinctive call, isn't it? The cry of a crow is very distinctive and it's annoying and it's obnoxious. That's actually what the word cry out means. He was crying out in a way that was loud, in a way that perhaps was obnoxious. It was obnoxious to the people. They told him to stop it. But he did it because he had faith, because he knew that Jesus of Nazareth was not just any man. How do we know that? Look at how he addresses him in verse 47 and verse 48. He specifically addresses him as son of David. What does that tell you he knew about Jesus? That tells you that he understood that Jesus of Nazareth was in the Davidic line, that he was the one that was claiming to be the descendant of David and the Messiah of Israel. That's a messianic term that he's using, son of David. He's saying, I'm believing you, that you're not just an ordinary man, that you are the Messiah. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's seeking. And the breakthrough in your life, in my life, will always begin when we recognize not only that Jesus is near, but we realize who Jesus is. And we begin to call out, or shall I say, ask in faith, completely dependent upon him because of who he is, to do what otherwise is impossible for anyone to do. You want to break through in your life? What do you want God to do for you anyway? It begins when you, like him, seek. Look at verse 48. I want you to see another thing about uh, this man, many charged him that he should hold his peace. 
but he cried the more a great deal. Instead of silencing silence him, it prompted him, them telling him to shut up, to be quiet, prompted him to even ask more and to ask more loudly, which tells me a, a second thing about a breakthrough in your life from God not only begins when you seek like this man, but when you are serious like this man. This man was serious. And I think that this is a crucial truth, that you and I become desperate enough to not let others talk us out of our plea to Jesus. There are a lot of naysayers that, are, that would try to discourage us from calling out to the Lord or try to undermine our faith in him. But God tells us, and Jesus himself says, keep on asking, but keep on asking all the while you are believing that what you're asking for, he will hear you and he will do for you. So keep on asking, but keep on asking believingly. You need a breakthrough in your life from the Lord? Seek. Be serious like this man. Here's a third thing. Look at verse 49. And Jesus stood still, and he commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Hey, be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. This is significant, verse 49. Something shocking, something stunning happened. Jesus stood still. I would say that without the fervent cries of this man, Jesus would have passed by as he had done often. He would have passed by. But he sensed faith in that cry. He sends faith in the voice of that blind man. And the Bible says in that verse, Jesus stood still. That's significant. And I want you to picture in your mind's eye, Jesus stopping in his tracks even before you. Jesus pausing. Jesus standing right in front of you. I mean, you're talking about the creator of all things your creator, taking the time to stop and to hear your need with a readiness to meet it. Jesus stood still. That's significant. Do you believe that Jesus does that with you? Do you believe that Jesus pays that close attention and cares that much about you, that if you call upon him, that if you ask him, that he will stop in his track, so to speak, and he will stand in front of you and he will hear what you are asking him and crying out to him to do. He sensed faith in that man's voice and he stood still. If he hadn't called out, or if he had stopped calling out when the people told him to be quiet, Jesus would not have stood still. So that's a significant point. I want you to look again, this time at verse 50 and 51. And he's, he's happy. <laughs> he just throws his coat aside and he rises and he came to Jesus. And verse 51, Jesus answered, and here it is, Scrutiny from Jesus. Scrutiny. Jesus said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Now, folks, do you think that Jesus didn't know what the man's problem was? I think everyone in the whole crowd knew what the man's problem was. It was obvious that he was blind and that he needed to have his sight restored. But Jesus takes the time to specifically ask him a very scrutinizing question. It might seem obvious to us, but it's not. This is scrutiny here. What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Let that sink in a moment. Jesus stood still. He's stopped in his tracks. He's paused. He's standing right in front of this man, the creator of this man. And he's stopping to hear his need 
and he's ready to meet that need, but he's not going to meet the need until he gets an answer from this blind man. What will you that I do unto you? What do you want from God? What do you want from God is another way of putting it. Jesus is right there in front of you. And he wants you to tell him what your greatest need is. That's why I asked you at the beginning, what do you want God to do for you? What do you think is your greatest need at this moment? What is that? What exactly do you want God to do for you? I think that's a critical part of what it takes for God to release and unleash his miraculous power in your life. That you answer that scrutinizing question that God proposes. What do you want God to do for you? Exactly. And then verse 52. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way. Of course, he answers the blind man said, Lord, <laughs> that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus in the way. Jesus said, go your way. He followed Jesus in the way. Here's the fifth and final thing I wanted to point out in verse 52. It happened all of a sudden. It was a sudden breakthrough. It was a breakthrough instantaneously and amazingly. In a moment of time, all changed for this man. He's suddenly able to see. And he has a new beginning for his life beyond his wildest dreams. And I think that he stumbled on the secret of unleashing God's miraculous working power. And uh, as a result, his life would never be the same. When he went to bed that night, his life was totally different from when he got up that same morning. And it continued to be so because of the power of God at work in his life. A crucial, a crucial part of implementing and activating God's touch in your life. The thing I believe that bridges the gap between what the Bible says and we believe and actually experience what the Bible says in our personal lives. The thing that turns God's head toward you, that causes God's hand to touch your heart, that, God, that, that, that causes God's heart to be moved toward you, his hand to touch your life, is simply this, that you believe him, that you depend upon him, that you exercise faith in him that you have a God-dependent obedience. You know, that's what God-dependence is. It's a, a dependence upon God so that you can obey God. That's what it's about. So, with those thoughts, let's pass out our papers again. Can I have a couple of uh, ushers here? Pass out some papers, Gabe. Amos, you want to pass out some papers? Don't no, forget it. I'm joking. I'm joking. I knew that'd get them up. Okay. Okay, so these papers, I want everyone to get one. If you need more, I have I have some more uh, that I can pass out here. I want every one of you to get a, a, a piece of paper. Yeah. These are small, but uh, give them out. Take that, take that part. Um, what I want you to do is to, I asked you at the beginning to think about it. I want you to write down on this paper or card, whatever you get. What do you want God to do for you? What's your greatest need? Is it a physical one? Is it a mental one? Is it an emotional one? Is it a relationship need? Is it a spiritual need? What do you want God to do for you? That's what Jesus asked Bartimaeus. And that's what God's asking you and I this, this afternoon. What do you want God to do for you? Write it down on that card. Don't put your name on it. Don't put your name on, on the paper or the card. Just write down what you want God to do for you. You need a few more? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Right on the on the blank side of uh, the card that you're given. I'm going to read. I'm going to read uh, some of these. I don't know if I can get them all read, but I'm going to read some of these. What you want God to do for you, all right? All right, here we go. You ready? I want uh, the Lord to show me when I act in doubt and fear and to run to him by faith. I want for God to heal my ears. I need God to empower me to obey his commandments by empowering me to mortify my flesh, die to self, help me to love him more. I want my mom and sister's salvation and more grace for me so that I could give more grace to others. A loving heart, a faithful child. The Lord to heal my heart, mind, and spirit that I may live a life totally devoted to him. I want the Lord to change my thinking. To show me the way to go and the purpose in my life for true happiness and joy without shying away. I want the Lord to rekindle the fire for reading and studying and hearing God's word. I want the, uh, God to cause my children to love him with all their heart. I want the Lord, I want to be able to hear his voice. I want salvation for all my generations until the Lord returns. I want to make him to make me more dependent on him. I want him to save my children and make them fishers of men. I want him to make me a vessel of his mercy and grace. I want uh, God to make me to be stable physically and mentally and spiritually. I want God to give me a heart for him. I want God to give me patience. I want God to do his will for my life. I want God to direct my future. I want God to give me victory in all areas of my life. I want God's total peace. I want God's blessing on my life. I want to have a, a, a more intimate relationship with God. I want him to draw nearer and help me to obey and save my family. I want God to give me a strong desire to have a better walk with him. I want God to give me more effectiveness. I want God to heal my family relationship. I want to, God to enable me to love him more than myself. I want God to save me from myself. I want God to give me a burden to tell others about the saving power of Jesus. I want God to revive my love for Jesus and to desire to obey him unconditionally. I want to order my steps and only, uh, <clears throat> I want God to order my steps and go with me. I want God to continue to reveal himself to me. I want God to keep my eyes on him. I want to, uh, I'm not going to say the, na the name of the person to get uh, through his struggles of hard times. I want God to make me a kinder and better person who lives for him. I want God to allow me to spend time, uh, connect and spend time with my friends. I want God's spiritual guidance. I want my whole family to passionately serve him. I want a great life full of wealth and prosperity. I want uh, to God to give me friends, increase my faith in him. I want God to teach me to depend on him rather than myself. I want a godly marriage and kids to raise in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, so those are a whole bunch of things that all of us want God to do for us. And you know what it is that you wrote down. I don't know what you wrote down, but you do. What you want God to do for you. My second question, this is where I want to interact with you uh, by you raising your hand if you have something to say. 
based upon what you've asked God to do for you. How does that become a reality? What's the biblical criteria, I might say, I might ask, for your desire that you wrote down to become a reality in your life? What has to happen? She says, like uh, Bartimaeus, we have to seek the Lord. Definitely. Someone else. For what you want from God to happen, what has to happen in you? What's your part? Yeah. Avoid distractions that would pull you away from focusing on what you want from God. So what does it take for you to... Okay, yeah. It takes, it takes you asking, exchanging your fear for his courage, right? And if it's that, yeah. to making sure that our heart is really clean before the Lord so that there can be a true connection there. And then just by faith, believing that when we have come clean with God, we are clean. And that's a vital part. That's why people keep confessing the same sin over and over again, because they don't believe that if he said, if you'll confess it, if you'll own it, I'll cleanse it. They don't take him at his word. They don't believe him. Yeah, brother. Fred. Getting to know him by reading his word. Okay, uh, get to if you whatever you want God to do in your life, you get to know him by reading his word. Yes, you got to know him. Impeded, so he wouldn't be hindered by anything. He's, uh, you know, a coat that was clinging around his uh, ankles. Maybe he just took it off so that he could get there without being tripped up without being hindered in any way. It's a, and I think it's a picture of his excitement. It's a picture of his excitement and his joy. And so I just want to get there. You know, I don't want anything hindering me. I don't want anything stopping me from getting to Jesus as quickly as I possibly can. Yeah. What do you want from God? It means that you must take the next obvious step of obedience that you know God wants you to take. If there's something that you know God wants you to do, you take that step in order to really, if you really desire to get what God, what you say you want God to do for you. And in this case, maybe it's casting away the coat, right? Anything that would hinder you getting to God. Yeah. What else? Yes. Right. Pray, believe, ask God with a believing heart. Uh, if you want this from the Lord, if you're going to ask him for it, you've got to believe that he's going to do it, right? And if, you, and if you believe he's going to do it, then you got to know it's his will. you got to be convinced that it's God's will, that what you want from the Lord, you can then ask in faith. You can ask believing. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? His will, in some cases, what we want from the Lord may not be God's will, such as a physical healing. It may be his will. I hope it's his will, but it may not be, right? At least for a period of time anyway. I'm sure Job wanted healing from day one when he got that bodily affliction. How long he suffered with that, I don't know, but eventually God healed him. So you got to be convinced that it's the will of God, I guess, before you can really ask in faith. Someone else? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Magda, and then our, our sister, Judith. So, uh, for example, if you want God's relief from stress, mental stress, you want God's peace, she's basically saying that you have to make that exchange and you have to depend upon him for his peace. By the way, it's a gift that he promises to his children. My peace give I unto you. It's a, it's a gift he promises to give you, but you never get a gift if you don't claim it and take it, right? If you don't take his peace that he offers, then it's not yours and it has to be taken by faith. It's something he wants you to have. You know it's God's will that he wants you to have peace so you can ask in total faith and depend upon him to give it to you.
but you give him, she's saying, you give him your stress and you take his peace in exchange for your stress, right? You don't hold on to your stress and take his peace at the same time. It doesn't work that way. You give your stress to him and you take his peace. And so your stress is replaced by his peace. Your anxiety, you give to him. You cast your care on him and you take his peace. I think also in Bartimaeus, right? Where he cried out to the Lord and they told him not to. They told him to be quiet. But instead of being quiet, he cried out more. So he was relentless and uh, he was serious about uh, his calling upon God. He was desperate. And that's what she's saying. And that is, I think, a vital part of us getting what we want from God. I mean, that's, uh, that's the end result of it. That's what ought to happen. Uh, anything that God does for us, we want to share with other people. That's why he does it. Not so that we can selfishly hoard it and uh, keep it to ourselves, but that we can share it with others. We want others. Look, if God has met a specific need in your life, something that you want from God, if he has met what you want, you're not going to be quiet about it. You're going to be amazed by it. And you're going to want others to have what you have as well. You know, that's what salvation is about. It's not something that we selfishly keep to ourselves. But if we have real salvation, we'll want others to share in it too. We want to tell others about Jesus. That's one of the motivating factors of being a believer. You can't be quiet because you have found such joy and satisfaction in Jesus that you want others to have that as well. So good point. You share it. Yeah. I want to share something that another person that I always say. And she's a manager. She managed the building. And then when she saw me one day, um, she said, Be what are you doing? And you look so healthy and everything. You said, I'm relying on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And she said, How? I said, I'm trusting in him like for my health and issues. She said, Well, that's what I need. I said, That's what we all need. Because without him, we can't do it. I'm not standing here with my health. I'm standing here with Jesus Christ. He gave me. And when he gives me, yeah, it begins with a trust in the Lord for salvation, and then it just becomes a trust in the Lord for everything, doesn't it? Amen. He gives He gives you the peace in the meantime, even before the want is answered. Right? He gives you the the grace to just. Stay in a holding pattern, I guess. Yeah. I think several things. What do you want from God? How do you get what you want from God? Several things that have been mentioned. If we could just take and, and maybe trim it all down. Number one, is what you want the will of God? Is what you want the will of God? That is... I think is the primary thing that has to be discerned is what you're asking, what you want from God. Is that the will of God? I don't believe that God wants you to have something that he knows in the long run may not be good for you. So is it the will of God? I think a second thing is, and again, all of these have been touched on by you and what you've shared is that you ask believing God. You ask believing that God hears you and that God, if he, if it's his will for you, he's going to do it. And then I think, uh, thirdly, that when you ask believing that you are depending upon God to do something specific in your life, not general, but specific. 
when what, what you want from God, make that as a specific request as you possibly can. Not just a general uh, thing, but a specific thing. You know what I mean by that? And then finally, take it. Reach out the hand of faith and take it. Claim it. What God, what you know is God's will, what you have believingly asked God for, what you are specifically de depending upon him for, by faith take it even before you have it, even before it is clearly manifest or revealed that it's your possession. You know what I mean by that? You know, it's like um, you know that there's a gift coming to you in the mail and you're anticipating that gift. It hasn't arrived yet, but you know it's coming. You, In fact, you might even have an email that tells you when it's going to be delivered, right? You know that gift's on its way. It's been shipped. It's going to be delivered at such and such a time. And you're anticipating that. It's yours. You've personally taken it, so to speak. When it comes, then there's that personal manifestation of that reality of that gift that uh, was on its way. When you ask God for something, even though maybe you cannot physically touch it or see it, if you have asked what is his will by faith, by faith, personally take it, claim it, and believe that it's done, that it's a done deal, that God has answered your prayer even before it is in any way physically revealed to you. You know what I mean? Stretch out the hand of faith. Hand of faith is an invisible hand. Stretch out the hand of faith, your hand of faith, and take what you've asked God, what you want from God, from his hand, personally, that personal reception and taking from the Lord. To me, that's a summary of how to get what you want from the Lord. Remember what you wrote down, what you want from God. Find out if it's his will and then go for it. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and close in prayer then. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We ask for you yourself. The greatest blessing that any human being could ever receive is you. We ask for a more greater realization of your presence in our lives. Lord, all that we wrote down on these papers today, what do you want from me? You ask us. And we wrote down what we want from you. Now, Lord, the way I see it, the majority of those things that were written down are things that you will for us, that you want for us. Lord, I pray that we would, like Bartimaeus, we would press our requests home to you with just that seriousness that he had with that uh, unrelenting uh, grip upon you, that we would see that power, that miraculous power of God's hand unleashed in our lives. Lord, there are things that you want to do for us that we have not even begun to even think about, let alone ask you for. May we find out what it is that you want to do for us as well as what we want you to do for us. We thank you again for how you are speaking and how you are working and, and your wonderful mercy. And we would cry out in closing with this blind man, son of David, have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, have mercy upon each one of us. 
We call unto you for your mercy. And we thank you for it. And we close today in the name of Jesus. Amen.